Bonjour, I'm Courtney Cogburn. I'm an associate professor at Columbia University in the School of Social Work, where I study racism and its effects on health, as well as scholarship at the intersection of emerging technologies and social justice. In my lecture today, I focus on innovations and methodologies in my work as a transdisciplinary social scientist, where I have developed work in ways to measure racism and its effects on health. I think about racism not only in the form of interpersonal experiences, but also in the form of structural and cultural systems. So in what ways does racism and inequities in race show up in our language, our rhetoric, our public discourse around social issues, our imagery and symbolism? And how might exposure to those messages in cultural systems affect health and affect decision-making and attitudes about race and positionality in society. I also think a lot about how we can measure those experiences. So I think a lot about media. So I think about how I might use social media and exposing people to different forms of social media and monitoring physiological responses and how the consumption of media can actually impact health by producing stress in the body that can have long-term implications for well-being. I also think about measuring chronic patterns in cultural racism. So I think about the use of Twitter data, for instance, and documenting patterns in racial violence in the United States with the police, and how public discourse in response to that violence might tell us a lot about how people are feeling and experiencing that violence, and even how they may be impacted in terms of their health. I've also developed work in virtual reality where I've come against this response where it's not always clear that our empirical data and scholarship around racism is doing enough to convince the general public that racism is a serious problem that we should all be thinking about and engaging. So I've used virtual reality to help change the ways that people think about their relationship to systems of racism. The experience that we've created, along with my colleagues at Stanford University, puts you into the digital shoes of a black male as a child, adolescent, and as an adult, experiencing racism in different contexts at each of those ages. Some people often misunderstand that that experience is about understanding blackness or understanding what it's like to be a black male or feeling more empathetic about the experiences of black males. Instead, what we're actually focused on is what racism looks like from the perspective of a black male. We want people to understand systems of racism. We want people to understand the significance of whiteness as a social phenomenon in relation to blackness and anti-black racism in particular from the perspective of a black male in this particular experience. So we're asking you to think about systems of racism and whiteness, not about the feelings and experiences of a black male experiencing racism. I've also started to move in a direction of thinking about not only documenting the effects of racism and uh, convincing people that racism is real and exists and that we should all be thinking about it and doing something about it, but I've also moved into a place where I want to think more about joy and creation and imagining the future I want myself and particularly my child uh, to live in, for us all to live in. And in particular, I've been thinking about the health benefits of imagination. Is it useful for well-being to be able to see and imagine oneself in the future? To be able to imagine a possibility where one's existence is not only fighting systems of oppression, but thinking about uh, different ways that we might relate and build the societies that we live in. I frame this specifically using the metaverse, which doesn't yet exist. It's a blank slate, it's becoming, it's developing as we speak. And part of what I'm doing is trying to encourage as many voices as possible, is being engaged in designing and creating that space, rather than, as Ruha Benjamin says, living in someone else's imagination as the metaverse starts to take form. So I'm thinking about the ways that I can create opportunities for young people, particularly marginalized and oppressed youth, to create this new digital space and to create spaces for themselves to feel free, their most authentic selves, and to reimagine the ways in which we interact and construct the ways that we build lives together. So I think for uh, young people whose existence um, is characterized by fight and struggle, 
who experience so many social threats, so many social disadvantages that they, their lives could be consumed by that fight. And so this notion of imagination is not ignoring that reality, but looking for ways to create another way to live and be in addition to that fight and struggle so that their lives aren't only consumed with uh, struggle. So I think that there are multiple ways to, to have that happen. One, we can just create opportunities for them to write and reflect and capture their real life experiences where they imagine feeling like their best selves, their most authentic self, or where they have felt most free. But we're also trying to explore ways to use digital technologies to help them create spaces that they can actually immerse themselves in and actually feel free um, and actually build the kinds of relationships that they'd like to have with others. So what I mean by that is that we can take existing tools like uh, Roblox or Minecraft or uh, tools like Unity that help people design digital worlds and spaces, teach them how to create those spaces and then see what they make. What do they create for themselves? What do they create as collectives? This is an enactment of imagination. This is not only describing pain and trauma and how they might cope with those realities, but it gives them a chance to imagine somewhere else and not only imagine it, but actually build it and create a space that they may want to partially live in um, and exist in. And for me, I'm not only interested in giving them the opportunity to do that, I'm interested in potentially the benefits to them. Might it impact their health? Might it help their mental well-being to be able to see them, their lives not only through a lens of pain and trauma, but to also see themselves as part of a future and a designer of the future. I do see the use of imagination and the types of spaces and worlds that say young people might create as having implications for policy. Because my work in cultural racism and my interest in culture suggests that that type of imagination might become part of our public discourse. It might become part of a collective narrative that changes the way that we think about our relationships with each other, that changes the way that we imagine how societies are structured because these young people have presented those alternatives to us. And perhaps they're given their position of marginality, might imagine justice in a way that some of us could never even consider. They may present viable options for restructuring the way that we live and exist with each other. Um, so it seems potentially a little far-fetched, but to make these alternatives visible and tangible and something that we might exact actually exist in and live in might start to change the way people think about uh, what's actually realistic and viable for us to create and make. We can't create policy that we can't imagine and perhaps these young people can help give us some alternative ways to thinking about how we uh, think about public policy, social policy, et cetera.